segment, we're going to get into the double ZEP antenna. Now, last month we got into the ZEP antenna, or the J-pole, and the J-pole was a fairly easy uh, antenna to make, and the double ZEP is just this simple. Uh, the actual length of copper pipe, the half-inch copper pipe that I, uh, that I bought, not only made one J-pole, but it also made one double ZEP antenna. Now, the reason I like this specific double ZEP antenna is it's actually dual band. It will operate in the two meter, as well as the 70 centimeter band, 2 meter being 144 to 148 megahertz, and uh, 70 centimeter being uh, you know between uh, uh, somewhere in the 440 band or 440 megahertz. So this actually does make it good for an emergency antenna. If you notice, I was able to use these uh, threaded fitting adapters, which I'll actually close up, uh, get a close up of in a moment, to uh, pretty much deconstruct this antenna to be easily portable. So you're not you know, holding this huge freaking cross affix of amateur radio around with you at all times. Another cool thing about this antenna, which I'll get another close up in a moment, is the actual feed point. The feed point in which I, the, uh, the actual RF or coax attaches to, you can actually design this so it's actually adjusted. Now, being that it can be adjusted down the actual ass end of this antenna makes it so you can actually change the resonant frequency, always good on the field, and you can actually change the SWR, which in a little while I'll show you how to tune this antenna on, uh, using an SWR meter. Making this an extremely versatile antenna that can be used on practically anything 2 meter and 440. Now, I can't recall the measurements off the top of my head, so I'll just measure them out for you real quick. I do believe this was close to uh, 16 inches. Yep, each one of these elements is 16 inches. And this is close to 18 inches. And there should be a half inch gap between the two. Now, of course, whenever you're making all of your measurements, you want to make sure you're, you're actually measuring the outside diameter, not the center or the, the, the outside. Now, uh, putting this together is relatively easy. You do not have to use copper pipe, but of course, the thicker the material that you're using, the more wattage you'll be able to pass through it. This can easily handle above 50 watts of power. Now, um, some people are probably scratching their heads right now going, hey, Fox, why in Sam Hill is the coax actually shorted out on this? And uh, the reason being, this is what we call a closed-loop dipole. Now, originally, when we were doing the Wi-Fi stuff, I only really mentioned uh, what we call an open-loop dipole, where you only have a wire going one way and then the other on the actual feed line. The reason we actually have a closed loop is we actually use this for an impedance match. By adjusting where the actual short on the wire is, we'll, or where the feed point will actually be, we'll actually adjust how much impedance, thus standing wave ratio, will actually be on the feed line itself. Now, let me go to the table side real quick, and I'll show you a little bit more about how I put this antenna together, and then we'll go into uh, tuning it with the SWR meter. The materials for a double zep are extremely easy to get. You can use copper pipe, or you can use any kind of conductive material that you can easily solder on. Now, of course, I had to go and use a propane torch. Now, whenever you're using any kind of propane or map gas torch, whatever you do, do not directly inhale any of its contents. That could be extremely hazardous to your, to your health and possibly kill more brain cells than you can afford. Now, whenever you're doing any kind of sweat soldering with copper, you need to make sure that your ends are extremely shiny. So wind up using some kind of abrasive pad, Brillo, uh, steel wool, or even sandpaper to make sure that your actual, uh, that the ends that you're soldering are extremely shiny. Now, I also did buy uh, soldering flux as well as common everyday, just solder for sweating, you know, copper pipes together. This stuff was relatively inexpensive. I think, um, just the materials here as well as the torch was about $20 and the length of copper pipe was about $20. So the antenna itself really shouldn't cost you more than $20, $25, not including the cost of connectors and such. Now, 
I also use this stuff called band iron. Band iron is typ typically used for affixing copper pipes or other electrical conduit to the ceiling in some kind of construction project. In this case, which I'll show you, I've actually used this as the feed point itself. Now, you'll actually notice that I'm using a square panel mount end connector, which was actually for, uh, left over from our Wi-Fi stuff. But I had to grind this down so it wouldn't actually make physical contact with the actual uh, you know, direct short with this. And if you notice, this is actually a direct short because it eventually does lead to the ass end of this. And this uh, band iron, you can also, if you're in a desperate pinch, just take wire, just copper wire, solid copper wire, 22 gauge bell wire, and wrap it around a whole bunch of tight times very nicely and very neatly and tightly, and then solder it directly to your feed point. You don't need to use an end connector. You can use a, a PL or an SO connector, whatever you know, whatever your radio requirements are. And by using this, or you can use um, the, what's called copper hangers. It's the same idea as the band iron. Now, the band iron might actually be called something else in your location. So uh, take, a pic, take a screenshot of this and show the person what it really is uh, when you're at the hardware store. But you can also use uh, copper pipe hangers. It's the same idea as this, made out of copper, that you can pretty much wrap around in the same fashion and allow it so you can actually adjust this up and down so you can actually adjust your SWR. Now, the actual fitted adapters that I have here, you'll actually notice that when they're actually screwed together, they, um, they will lead in one direction, meaning that when it rains, the water will not drip into the threading. The water will actually drip around and over the threading. So when water drips, notice it'll go over these threads and then it'll drip off of these threads. It won't go the other way. It will not drip into the threading. Being that copper will tarnish and can rust, if you get this wet, it will eventually turn into a green piece of crap, much like the Statue of Liberty. So, uh, if you do plan on caving this outside like Mustang and Uxer have, I would highly recommend that you coat the entire thing in some kind of spray paint. Uh, Non-conductive, of course, you know, just some kind of flat color. If you have some kind of homo uh, homeowners association that will get really pissy if you have an antenna outside of your house, so you can actually paint it to match the siding of your house and hide it fairly well. Now, some precautions whenever doing any kind of sweat soldering. You do not want to go and point the flame, which you cannot always see, in the direction of anything that you're not afraid to destroy. Never grab the actual copper pipe with your bare hands. Always have a couple of spare pairs of pliers, and perhaps even locking pliers on hand so you can actually manage your material. Uh, do not, whatever you do, do not do any kind of welding on concrete. Concrete does contain small minute amount of water that can evaporate, or they'll heat up, get superheated, expand, and will shatter little bits of the concrete, not only ruining the concrete itself, but, and in my case has, shot scalding hot bits of concrete directly into my eyes. So, you have been warned. Now, uh, I really don't know much more to tell you about sweat soldering. It's a fairly simple process, and as long as you're not a total fucking idiot about it, you can easily put this thing together. If you really aren't comfortable with sweat soldering, uh, you can easily just use copper wire and make a lower wattage version of this very same antenna. Let's go to the SWR side, and I'll show you exactly how to tune the double zap antenna for a specific SWR for whatever frequency you plan on operating on. All right, here we have my SWR meter, the double zap feed point, got some coax, got my radio. Now, the double zap antenna is actually being held in place by a desk clamp, and I'll show you in a moment that not only the additional material that's being held over here, but your physical body, when it gets in the way of the antenna itself, will actually throw the SWR off. Now, um, I'm going to key up at 5 watts on a very low frequency on the, uh, on the amateur radio 2-meter uh, uh, band, and we'll go and get an SWR check. All right, so that's putting out relatively good SWR. Let me go up to the upper side of the, uh, the uh, amateur radio 2 meter band. Oh, wrong frequency. Now notice how that's 1.6 to 1. That's, that's a little high. So what we're going to do is we're going to just take this feed point. We're going to move it back until we can eventually... Oops, changed my radio frequency. All right. I'm going to move this down a bit. Okay, now we're down to 1.4, a little bit over 1.2. All 
All right, one point, lower isonora to 1.2 to 1. We'll go back to the, the lower side. There we go. We're pushing out 305 watts. All right. So let's go to the uh, 70 centimeter band, 440 megahertz. It's pushing out pretty good. Let's go to, uh, uh, still only pushing about one and a half watts. So again, you just go and adjust the actual feed point. Now, let's go back to the, uh, the two meter band real quick. All right. So watch the SWR meter. Barely moving. Let's throw the SWR off a bit. Still not throwing it off. Still not throwing it off. All right, let's, come on, give me some SWR, damn it. All right, now watch what happens when I actually get in the way. Now, not sure if you noticed or not, but just your physical presence that's actually passing through the, uh, the, radio's, the radio field that's emanating by the antenna is actually going to throw off the standing wave ratio. Now, that's another cool thing about the actual double ZEP. It makes it a great amateur radio, emergency use, or just general use antenna. Not only can you actually change its resonant frequency by adjusting the actual position of the feed point, you can also adjust the standing wave ratio. And with a little bit of elbow grease, you can actually unscrew the elements and break it down to be a relatively easy to carry with you portable antenna, making the double ZEP so far one of my favorite general use radio antennas. Hello, this is Uber Archangel. I'm going over overclocking and heat dissipation, heat sinks, fans, CPU paste, and power supply. What we have here is your generic motherboard. As you can see, there's a white outline around each, both the north bridge and the CPU. That is where your retention bracket and also your CPU cooler is going to be is <clears throat> within the space along within the north bridge. If you can see the RAM, there's very little slot and very little space in between the slots to have heat dissipation, which creates a major issue when you're trying to cool the RAM. Along with the fact if you add a heat sink in the middle, you're, you're looking at next to nothing for room unless you have air blowing down on it, you're not going to dissipate any heat, making it utterly worthless. If you look at the north bridge, north bridge is actually basically the same as a CPU, except it's a little bit bigger, and it controls your voltages, your sound, your video, that kind of stuff. You can up the voltage on this. Most of the time, the heat sinks are kind of crappy for it, and they normally put cheap thermal paste on it, so think about replacing them or adding a fan or whatever. But that, that covers the motherboard for the most part. Right here we have four, we have three CPUs, and we're going to go over thermal paste, and different kinds of CPU cooling, lapping, and what they are, what they mean. Right here we have the really, really cheap version of cooling your CPU, which is actually a pad. Looks absolutely horrible, and it is. It doesn't cool very well at all, and creates major issues, and can actually melt and stick to things. Not very good. Um, the other option they have is aluminum tape, also not good, very bad idea, and also conductive. We have Arctic Silver and Cremate. These are the two different types of thermal paste I actually use. Cremate is good for RAM. It's silicone based. It's non-conductive. It's not going to pull electricity through the thermal paste onto other components. Arctic Silver will, but if you're just putting it on the CPU, it's not going to create a major issue. What we have here is a CPU with the heat sink still on from the factory and with the heat sink off from the factory. The differences are underneath of here, there is a thermal paste in between this heat sink and the actual chip, like there is here. That will not necessarily be the best thermal paste in there. But if you go to try to pry that off, you're going to break your chip in half. Even if you do it right, there's a 90% chance you're probably going to break something, making your chip that you just bought utterly worthless and not really good for anything other than a paperweight or a keychain. Now what lapping is, is if you take a CPU like this and you take and grind this flat because 
whether you can see it or not there's actually little divots there's also normally a little bit of a ravine to it and that doesn't work out very well and it also decreases the thermal paste's ability to conduct heat properly now you can lap it but you also got to realize as you're lapping it you're generating heat you could also generate static electricity and fry the CPU making it worthless once again a keychain not worth it in my opinion but it can be done and when you do it there's a whole procedure on it I'll put up information in the show notes and why I don't prefer to do that what we have here are several different types of heat sinks they're all done with different methods in mind when they're actually using them this is a Northbridge heat sink therefore you don't need anything real special with it it just has the normal clips has crappy thermal paste on the back now if you're overclocking you might want to try upgrading that what we have here is an original Pentium it used to have a clip on fan across here and it would spiral in there but the fact of the matter is it pushes air out through these fins which is the way most of the cooling is done now for CPUs is they push the air down and out against the CPU trying to cool it what we have here is an old Pentium heatsink that was the second generation after that normally have a fan on top helped cooling a lot um, this is actually a old heatsink for Northbridge or for a really really ancient CPU you can actually cut this in half and use it for RAM but remember if you're going to do that use a cream make with it so that you don't have electrically conductive thermal paste on there this happens to be an example of a flower type pattern on either end here that helps with cooling especially when doing it with fans because it happens to follow the same airflow that fans normally do and this is a really good heatsink uh, you probably can't see it very well in frame. I'll try to zoom in and get a, a capture of it later. It actually has little ridges on the actual fins, improving the cooling very much so. Right here is an example of just a cheap heat sink, but it's got a whole lot of surface area. The more surface area, the better the increased cooling you're going to have. But remember, you always have to have airflow flowing across it to increase the cooling to a level that's normal for the CPUs of nowadays. And what I have here is an aftermarket GPU cooler. It actually uses heat pipes which run along and are connected to each one of these fins. And they're connected on the back to a, a copper plate that touches against the GPU using your Arctic Silver thermal paste and will cool or heat the pipes and the heat from the pipes dissipates down each pipe equally and then gets cooled by the fins. This model happens to be great for the card it was designed for. I tried using it for a more powerful one, didn't work out so well. So, what I have here is a regular computer case. It's a cheap case, it cost me 50 bucks. Um, the thing is about it, it can beat a $300 case when it comes to cooling. The reason why is I have a fan up top up here that I actually pull the hot air out this way because obviously it's going to be standing out hot air rises common sense would say have the fan up top pull the air out then you have this fan on the side this pushes air directly down on top of the CPU fan thus making it a very good cooling side panel and then of course if you have a stand up cooler you will need a fan back on the back and a fan on the actual heatsink and they both blow out the case because this is the hottest component you want to get the hot air out of the case the cool air in the case this case 50 bucks comes with power supply I don't understand why people pay $300 for an all aluminum case when my air cooling beats their air cooling in their case it doesn't make any sense so when you are getting a case that's what you want to look for you want to look for front intake ports you want to look for a rear 120 millimeter spot to be able to put a fan for exhaust you want to have a fan that's going to blow air directly down your CPU and you're going to want to have an exhaust fan up top most cases don't have this if you look at the $300 cases they don't have them you look at a cheap cheap $50 case that's when they actually start to have them and it makes common sense to buy the one that's going to have the better coin so that's why I bought this case now we're going to go into components and how close things get 
when you're putting on aftermarket heat sinks, etc. This happens to be a stock heat sink, but as you can tell, the distance between the north bridge and the CPU is incredibly, incredibly small. It's just enough to fit two wires, not even three wires past. So you, when you're buying an aftermarket heat sink, you have to do the measurements yourself. Make sure the stuff's going to fit when you get it. And as you can see, the heat from this, by this blowing down on this, it blows heat across this way through the grooves making it so that it will actually cool the north bridge using the CPU cooler. Most people don't look at that stuff. You have to look at it. If you get one of the ones that stands up and blows this way, you no longer have that air that they planned on having blown across this, so you have to add a fan. These are th simple things that people don't look at when they do cooling and they buy all this aftermarket stuff that looks real nice and fancy. You don't have to get something fancy. Just look at it and think, is this going to work thermally for my computer. As you can see here, this has slightly more space than the regular RAM, so this can actually fit heat sink RAM. Some motherboards, the RAM is so close together that you can't fit heat sink RAM into your motherboard. Also, if you notice, this has a open spot right here, which is very good because that means you're going to have good cooling on this stick and this stick. And on these, you're going to have the outside cooling, which means the cooling is going to be slightly better on this than on one that has all four slots crammed together. And you're not going to get any cooling that way because you have no airflow. That's another reason why this fan up here is also important because as this pulls down onto this, you're getting cool air, and then the cool air is getting accelerated even more by this, and then it's going to blow over here. It's going to hit your RAM. It's going to cool your RAM some. So you want to look at that. And there's different motherboard layouts. Some of them actually have it so that the RAM is going to be cooled by the CPU fan. If that's true, you have to get something that's going to blow across the, the RAM for cooling if you get a vertical heatsink. Remember, just take a look at everything that goes into the computer and think, is this going to work thermally for the computer? Also, when you're getting into all this stuff, you're going to need a good CPU as I mentioned, or good power supply as I mentioned before multiple times. When you have a good power supply, most of the time they're going to be single rails. Single rail power supplies can create a lot of noise, so you have to make sure you get a high quality one and check the, the hardware reviews to make sure there's not going to be noise on your actual audio channel and it can also interfere with USB connections and all kinds of things. As you've seen in our previous segment, we have the voltages going up and down. With a good power supply, the voltages are going to be more stable than you saw in that BIOS and are not going to sway very much up and back because the more sway you have, the more the parts have to try to adjust and too much sway means you could get too much voltage or too little voltage and that can affect your RAM, that can affect your CPU, that can affect your north bridge, it can affect anything in the computer, whether it be hard drive, doesn't matter. Here we have a problematic Nintendo plagued with the most predominant issue of the NES ever, the reset of Doom. In this segment, I'm going to show you some repair tips and techniques that will actually show you how to get your NES uh, back online, back in action, and working like it just came right out of the factory. Before we begin, I'd like to actually explain what is actually causing this reset. If you notice, the LED in the front is resetting once every second. Now, the reason being is primarily because of something called the CIC lockout chip. When Nintendo actually created the NES, they wanted dominant control over who made what games for their console. Reason being is that the actual video game crash in the 80s was primarily due because there were too many shitty games produced by people who didn't know dick about games. So, Nintendo knowing this, they wanted to do something about it. Plus, they also wanted dominant region control, meaning they do not want Jap games in USA, they don't want USA in Jap, they don't want uh, UK games in Japan and vice versa. So in a way, it's just a um, company just making a stupid mistake, shitting on us in the long run, causing a technical problem with their stupid lockout chips, much to do with practically every single Sony console ever made, and also because of mechanical problems within the actual NES itself. Alright, so this mystical, magical CIC chip, it's actually a microcontroller developed by Nintendo and Nintendo only. Only two companies, to my knowledge, were ever known to make replicas of this chip. Both of them were sued by Nintendo. 
Uh, what the CIC chip does is it's an actual encryption communication chip, which like, I'll put some links on the show notes of exactly how its function works and even some lawsuits by, uh, by Codemasters and uh, Tengen. But anyway, what the CIC chip does is the microcontroller will communicate within the NES to a game cartridge. So I've actually got Legend of Zelda here, and I'll show you the CIC chip in here as well as inside the NES. So when you put this in, the first thing that happens is the CIC chip comes to life. If it does not communicate with another CIC chip, It'll actually send a reset signal to the actual uh, processor of the NES, telling it to reset once every second. Now, because of this CIC lockout chip, which is the primary, uh, primary, primary problem, sorry, primary problem of what actually causes this, um, we need to disable that chip. Reason being is because you can actually play import games that do not have a CIC chip. In fact, the earliest models of the NES did not have a CIC chip. It was only on on certain revisions of NES. Now, it is quite popular, but there are games that do not have a CIC chip, very early NES games. Now, the thing is, if you have an early model uh, NES game that does not have a CIC chip, if you actually feel the weight of the cartridge, you'll notice that it's going to be heavier than a later game. Reason being is they actually had to plug the cartridge into an adapter board that did have a CIC chip. Meaning, even if you don't have a CIC chip, you can go and scrap like Gyromite or some of the Balloon Fight, some of the really early games, and get a carrier board that has a CIC chip, completely defeating Nintendo's original idea of why to put a CIC chip inside the console. So, um, the primary reason that the CIC chip fails is because the edge connector with inside the actual NES, because you have to keep pushing the game up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, those pins inside the actual NES cart connector will go out of place over time. And when you can't have communication within, within the CIC chip of the cartridge, it resets over and over and over again. Not to mention a lot of us have actually played Legend of Zelda, uh, the original Legend of Zelda, for a month or more at on end. And there was no saving back then, so you had to keep your NES going at all times. And we come home one day, or we wake up one day and find out that our NES is resetting over and over, and we lost all of our work. What happened was, the system overheated, the chip failed, and at any point whatsoever that the communication between the CIC chip within the console and the game break, fail, or do not authenticate in any way, shape, or form, instantly starts to reset over and over again. So, we can disable the actual CIC chip inside the actual NES, so it no longer functions, Keeping it so, the console will never have that one hertz cycle. We'll fix the pins inside here. We'll also look at some other common issues and problems inside the NES. And I'll show you some tips and techniques on how to get this son of a bitch working as if it just rolled right out of the factory. Alrighty, as promised, here's the inside of Legend of Zelda. On the side, you can actually see it's NES, has an SN ROM, and it has the production date, Nintendo. Here's our battery backup for our save games. Uh, this battery can actually fail at some point. You can actually take soldering iron to this and replace it with a standard PC battery. If you want, you can even actually put it in one of those BIOS battery clip holders so you can replace the battery whenever you want. Here's our actual uh, program memory. Here's our character memory. We know that they're programming character because they're actually printed on the circuit board. Right here it says CHROM, which is character ROM, meaning this is our graphics, and PRG is our program ROM. And this right here is our actual SRAM. Over here, on the chip itself, we actually see MMC, which is Memory Map Controller, which is just a chunk of logic that addresses what goes where inside of a game. If you remember the NES lobotomizing, you should be a little familiar with the actual MMC. If you look on the board, we actually see the, the, the letters CIC. Right here is the CIC chip. Now, this is the CIC chip inside the game. It would be a little bit more effective to actually disable the chip inside the actual NES itself, rather than in every single one of your games, being that you really can't open up all of the games since they use a custom game bit. So anyway, we're going to get to the actual NES side. We're going to start taking it apart, Phillips head screwdriver, basic technique, and we'll get into the NES. All right, for those of you who are not very tech savvy with the soldering iron, not absolutely necessary, but you can proceed and solder if you'd like. Basic tools, we're going to need some kind of wire cutters, screwdrivers, a needle nose pliers, and a paper clip. Paper clip will actually have to be folded into a special hook utility. Uh, you know what, let me zoom in and get a closer look of that. As I said, uh, standard paper clip, you can also use a safety pin, some kind of sturdy metal. Using a pair of needle-nose pliers, we're going to have to make a small little hook end. We're going to use this to actually put the pins back in place. This was made from an ordinary paper clip. You can also make this, ideally, from a very large safety pin. If you don't have one, paper clips should work just fine. If you are completely whatsoever tech unsavvy, you really don't even need to take your NES apart. 
Um, I'll actually put it in the, in the show notes on the forums. There's actually online guides. I really can't get a good shot with the actual camera. But with inside the actual NES deck itself, you can actually reach this tool inside to actually fold the top row of pins and the bottom row of pins back into place. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and take the actual NES apart so I can show you the technique uh, without actually having to go and rework my camera into the orifice of an NES. Alright, I've taken the top off the NES, nothing more than the simple use of a Phillips head screwdriver. Here's the eject loader, which is the primary problem within the NES. And you can actually see all of the pins down down here. And uh, using this tool, you can actually just, let me see if I can do it. You can actually sneak underneath and then just lift them up one at a time over and over again. Uh, it's just a very awkward angle for me, so I really can't show you. But, I mean, it's, it's a very obvious technique. You just put the, uh, the hook end by the side underneath. And as you rotate, you can lift it up a bit. So all of those pins actually raise back into position. From here, if your Nintendo just has a constant reset problem, this should fix it. But I'm going to go further in and do a little bit more explanation of some of the other uh, technical issues with the actual NES. All right. Now, I've taken all the screws out, and everything pretty much just comes apart. I've already unplugged all the cable harnesses. If you wanted to get further access into the actual cartridge connector, the deck literally just falls right out of place. Uh, you're going to have a couple of uh, connectors on sides and front. Controller connectors over here. Random asked me to give a pin out because his NES controller ports were damaged, so I'll put that up as a screenshot in a moment. If you wanted to actually go and completely replace this connector, this RF and heat shielding will literally come right off, exposing the bare circuit board underneath the NES motherboard. And this connector, a lot of people will actually go on eBay and sell a brand new, you know, NES cartridge connector. Really, they just refurbish it. They go in, they're doing exactly what I'm doing, and they just rip you off by selling more. Uh, this will literally unplug. Just try not to, trying to do it in a way where I'm not going to cut up my hands on circuit tracks. All right, there you go. It's removed. If you really, really need to go in and service this connector, this is the way to do it. It's very simple. Just use of a screwdriver and this handy dandy paper clip tool that we made. We can go in and realign every single one of these pins without any fear of damaging it whatsoever. Unless you're a complete freaking idiot. Okay, so we got all of this removed and we're actually down to the motherboard. So uh, over here we have the uh, power LED reset button all that jazz. We've got our two controllers. We have the bottom extent extension port. Uh, we've got some SRAM floating around. We've got, you know, whatever. Zoom into that in a moment. I actually want to focus on this box right here. So let me zoom in and actually show you this box real quick. This big unit right here is actually the RF box as well as the power supply. Uh, you can actually take these, these pins right here and take a multimeter to them and actually figure out which ones are voltage, audio, RF in, RF out. Then the NES actually natively spits out a composite signal and going through this actual RF box you'll get some signal noise. So if you really want a true composite signal you can tap into these points and get a much cleaner signal. Now if we come over to this, this spot right here, this little device right here is actually called a voltage regulator. This is the LM7805 voltage regulator. This means it actually spits out a 5 volt regulated uh, voltage source to the actual console itself. Now, this can actually overheat and die. The NES does in fact run off of an AC or an alternating current voltage source, but being a digital circuit, being a computer, an 8-bit computer at that, it requires digital or a, or a DC voltage. So, in this case, it needs 5 volts. This can easily be replaced. Uh, you can actually go into a lot of common household electronics and pull out an LM7805 voltage regulator. Now, the thing about an LM7805 regulator or all linear regulators for that matter, they require 3 volts above their output voltage. So, this is a 5 volt regulator. It needs a minimum of 8 volts to run. So, typically, the NES should be run off of 9 volts. I do believe it can handle up to either 24 or 34 volts, but ideally 9 volts or between 9 and 12 will operate the NES with this voltage regulator. Albeit if you operate it from a higher voltage, you do put more strain and this will generate more heat and it will blow out. So if your, if your original power supply has malfunctioned and you've replaced it, this could actually be a key component of why your console doesn't turn on. 
This would not be very difficult. You just take some desolder braid, uh, desolder, uh, take the solder off of these three little points, take the actual LM7805 out, it'll actually be marked as a 17805, go and get the pinouts online, type in one, uh, 17805 datasheet, and make sure you get something with similar pinouts. If not, make it a gender bender or an adapter. I'll actually go into voltage regulators in another segment, but for the most part, let's get down to the actual board level. All right, so we're actually looking for something called U10. Now, here's U3, here's U1. This is our SRAM for our WRAM. Here's our VRAM. This is U2. And what is this one? Ah, here it is. All right, yeah, U10 right here. Let me try to move some of these parts away and get in a better, cleaner, closer shot. U10, uh, U on, the, on this board indicates that it's a chip. Chip number 10 is going to be your CIC chip. This is the chip that we're going to have to modify if you want to do a CIC lockout mod. Let me zoom in and get a better close-up shot. Okay, this is as close as I can get it. I hope you can read it. Mine actually is labeled as 319A. I'll put in the show notes a document that will actually list the common CIC lockout chips. If you can notice where I'm pointing right here, it actually says CIC U10. Now, if you notice, there's a little dot right here. Do you see that? I hope so. Because if you don't, you're fucked. But either way, this dot signifies pin 1. So this is going to be pin 1. Where are you? Uh, pin 1, pin 2, pin 3, pin 4. That pin right there will need to be severed and either attached to ground, which you can use the RF shielding over here as ground, or use a multimeter to find any negative point. Or you can actually just snip it and leave it floating, just bend it away from the board. Now, I've actually known people who have gone as far as completely desoldering this chip and putting in a socket so they can remove the chip uh, whenever the hell they need. And they were, it was just a lot more work, but eh, it worked. But either way, I'm going to go ahead and snip this pin 4, and I'm just going to leave it floating with my pair of wire cutters. And we're going to go ahead and put the NES back together and check out the uh, before and after of the CIC mod. All right, if you notice, I completely removed pin 4. Now, typically, like I said, you are supposed to actually solder this to ground. If this does happen and you completely destroy the top of the leg like I just did, you'll actually have to take a, a sanding tool or some kind of file, etch into the chip, and then solder onto the leg to repair this. So let's pray to God that this fucking works. All right, I'm going to go and just loosely put the NES back together. I'm not going to put any of the screws in, just in case I screwed up completely on uh, international IPTV. And we'll go ahead and see if this works. Before we end this segment, I've got one more quick, really good tip for you. If you notice that this card connector has a lot of really, really nasty, grimy buildup and oxidization, uh, you can actually use household everyday jewelry cleaner to turn the pin connectors uh, and the pad connectors like this to looking more like this. If you notice, this has no oxidization, it's completely shiny, and it's completely re, uh, redone. It's brought right back to life. All right, so I'm going to zoom out, and I'll just show you the basic process of how I did this. This is a fairly simple technique. Uh, go, ooh, this is open. Go get yourself a inexpensive canister of average household jewelry cleaner. I think this probably cost me about $3, but you can get really small ones for inexpensive. Uh, read on the back, make sure that it actually will work with copper. If it doesn't work with copper, then you're going to have a problem. Make sure it doesn't eat copper, because if it eats copper, you're going to ruin this. So, uh, what I've done is, I've actually taken a toothbrush, and I just went inside, and I sloshed a bunch of the, cl uh, of the cleaner around. Now, whenever you're doing this, don't do this towards yourself, because the bristles will flick. And most of the jewelry cleaners, no matter how inexpensive or pungent they are, if you get them in your eyes, they're going to burn like a son of a bitch. So only, always go side to side because the bristles of the brush are going to flick jewelry cleaner all over the place. Also, working in an environment that you don't have a lot of things that you want to get stained, uh, oftentimes I'll actually work inside my kitchen sink and I'll put this all the way into the uh, bottom of the kitchen sink so all of the splashes around the inside of the sink that can easily be washed away. So, read the instructions to your jewelry cleaner, make sure that it can work with copper and it won't destroy copper since the pads on this and on here are, in fact, copper. And uh, read the instructions for safety warnings. Some of them are very pungent and should not be handled with bare hands. You might need gloves. This stuff is pretty safe. 
So all I did was take a regular everyday Q-tip for the cartridge connector, I dipped it in, and I just swabbed it around. And uh, the instructions say to actually leave it for about two minutes. Uh, I done so, and then it says you have to rinse. Now if you use a Q-tip, uh, because such a toothbrush will not get inside the actual cart connector of an NES cart, you can just use a Q-tip to go in. And this will actually remove all of the dirt and the crap and the oxidization off of the pin header of the cartridge connector as well as the actual NES game console. Uh, if you need to rinse, don't worry about it. Um, I would not soak these overnight or anything like that. Uh, you can just, this you can submerge in water and then just flick it off and let it air dry. NES carts on the other hand, go in with a cotton, uh, with a cotton swab or something of the like and then go in with a dry one just to make sure that water doesn't actually leak in and just really give it a thorough job and there's not much elbow grease involved. So. Just using average household uh, uh, jewelry cleaner, you can actually take all the tarnish and oxidation, oxidization off all of the pins to the cart and connector. So hopefully with these tips and techniques, you'll be able to bring your NES and your games back to life. Alrighty, I've got the control deck and all the mechanics tightened down. Make sure you get the screws nice and tight. If this wobbles around any, it's going to cause any problems. The green line in my screen, ignore this is not coming from the screen or the Nintendo. I have a really crappy power supply, so pretend it's not there. Now, before we actually even go into testing the games, uh, Random asked me to uh, give him some ideas on how to fix the controller ports on the NES. Now, uh, his dick brother decided to go and huck the thing across the room, and it damaged both of the ports on the NES. Um, by now, I should have posted some actual screen captures of the actual pinouts and where they go. I'll put some in the show notes as well. However, if your connectors are physically damaged, what you can do is there are two screws underneath the NES, literally right under here. You can take this entire piece out and either buy a replacement or you can get nine pin serial port connectors called DB9 serial connectors. You can cut the back ass end of the, of the connector off of the controller and solder in a nice DB9 connector. I'll put a screenshot up. And you can put the maiden connectors on a piece of plastic and then just kind of rework this. That way you can actually fix your controller ports. Uh, also, the actual LED in the front is just a typical LED. If you want to be able to do any kind of modding to that, you can easily replace it. 3 volt LED or 3.3 volt, no big deal. Before you even put your actual NES together, you know, the NES is almost as old as I am. It would be a good idea to go ahead and go in a 1 to 10 ratio of bleach to water. Meaning, for every one part bleach, ten parts water. So one complete, one cup of bleach, uh, ten parts water. Uh, go ahead and soak all of the plastic. It'll clean it up really nice. If your parents come in and bitch on what the fuck you're doing in the bathroom and make a mess, tell them to shut your mouth. You're cleaning the tub, and in the process, all of your plastic stuff anyway. So that'll actually get the plastic looking like new. This is not applicable to the original uh, SNES that turns piss yellow. Completely different reason. Won't won't work. I've tried. All right. So I've got uh, two games here. I've got. Metroid, and I've got Super Mario Brothers 3. So when I first started this segment, uh, I actually started the segment out where the, the actual control deck was ejected, meaning the CIC chip could not communicate to the cartridge, and it would reset. It would reset once every second. So when we turn this on, it should work first try. Works for, well besides the green line. Works first try. So if I actually eject this it should actually start to cycle on and off one hertz as the process of the CIC chip. And if you notice the LED, is it blinking on and off? Which means the CIC chip is completely disabled. Now we'll try Metro. First time, every time. If you actually want to go the extra mile, what you can actually do is take an alcohol swab and clean out all of the contacts and whatnot, but be really careful not to use anything that's corrosive because this is copper. You do not want to cause any kind of tarnishing or anything like that. So, um, I guess that pretty much covers everything. I hope it answered everyone's questions on how to actually revive your NES and get it restored to practically factory new. All of my consoles, uh, consoles have been cleaned, all of my, my, my carts have been cleaned, CIC chips have been disabled, uh, regulators have been replaced if necessary, all of my decks and my cartridges work first time, every time. And that CIC chip, CIC chip completely disabled. That's really weird how it's actually playing that. That's creepy. Anyway, 
Hope everyone enjoyed the segment. I hope I uh, actually answered all of your questions. If anything, as always, on the forums, hit the show notes. I'm on IRC. I'll be more than willing to help you guys out trying to get your NES back to life. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, I told a friend of mine we were doing a show on Unix, and he said to me, why in the world would you want to feature a Unix on a computer <laughs> show? Now, the moral of the story is, while some computer people are talking about nothing but Unix, some PC users don't even know what Unix is. Why is there this sudden excitement about Unix? Well, it shouldn't be sudden excitement. Uh, Unix itself has been around since the late 60s. Uh, the problem is that micros haven't had the power to support it. They haven't had the large amount of mean memory, the hard disk, the fast processor, and so forth. But nowadays, micros do have that power, and so Unix becomes a serious contender for an operating system standard. Okay, and in fact, many people are saying Unix might become the standard operating system of the future, but there are many uses of Unix going on right now. We have a report. Developed in the late 1960s at Bell Laboratories, Unix was later adopted by the University of California for academic research and publishing. At Berkeley's History of Science Department, typesetting of journals and directories is accomplished from start to finish on a network of Unix-based terminals. Why Unix? Well, apart from the fact that a major version of Unix was designed at Berkeley, it's an eminently portable system. From micro to mini to mainframe, Unix is easily adapted with few or no changes required. The typical Unix network runs on mini computers. User-initiated tasks are distributed among computers through port selectors. But the advantages of Unix are not limited to multi-user portability. The system is also fast and powerful. Once the user has mastered its unorthodox commands, he's rewarded with some very sophisticated features, like background processing. After initiating a task, the user can go on to another one, while the system continues to work on the first. Surrounding the kernel of Unix is a shell, or central command interpreter, that redirects application input and output, manipulates files, and stores command sequences. The shell structure, unlike the commands, is friendly, allowing even the first-time user to perform complex tasks. Unix users give the system high marks for its versatility. Yet up until now, it's been largely confined to a small group of specialized users. It has proven itself to them. Now it must prove itself to the rest of us. To kind of explain what Linux is, you have to explain what an operating system is. And the thing about an operating system is that you, I mean, you're not, never ever supposed to see it because nobody really uses an operating system. People use programs uh -huh. on their computer. And the only mission in life of an operating system is to help those programs run. So an operating system never does anything on its own. It's only waiting for the programs to ask for certain resources or, or s ask for a certain file on the, on the disk or ask for the programs to connect them to the outside world. And then the operating system comes, steps in and, and tries to make it easy for people to write programs. Where did the ideas that led to what is now called open source, where, how did that begin? Who, who began that? Well, it actually began with the start of computers because at that time, software was just passed around between people. And I think it was only like in the late 70s, early 80s, that people started really closing up their software and saying, no, you can never get a look at the source code. You can't change this software, even if it's necessary for you to fix it for your own application. And um, you can actually blame some of that on Microsoft. They were one of the real pioneers of the proprietary software model. In the mid-1970s, a group of hackers and computer hobbyists in Silicon Valley formed the Homebrew Computer Club. In the club's January 31st, 1976 newsletter, Bill Gates of the recently formed Microsoft wrote an open letter to the community where he made a point-by-point -point argument for the relatively new concept of proprietary software. Up to that point, the practice of computer users had been to freely pass around software with not much thought given to its ownership. Known as an open letter to hobbyists, Bill Gates writes, To me, the most critical thing in the hobby market right now is the lack of good software courses, books, and software itself. Without good software and an owner who understands programming, a hobby computer is wasted. Will quality software be written for the hobby market? Gates goes on to write, The feedback we have gotten from the hundreds of people who say they are using BASIC has all been positive. 
Two surprising things are apparent, however. One, most of these users never bought BASIC, and two, the amount of royalties we have received from sales to hobbyists makes the time spent on Altair BASIC worth less than $2 an hour. Why is this? As the majority of hobbyists must be aware, most of you steal your software. Hardware must be paid for, but software is something to share. Who cares if the people who worked on it get paid? Is this fair? One thing you don't do by stealing software is get back at MITS for some problem you may have had. MITS doesn't make money selling software. One thing you do do is prevent good software from being written. Who can afford to do professional work for nothing? What hobbyist can put three-man years into programming, finding all bugs, documenting his product, and distribute it for free? The fact is, no one besides us has invested a lot of money in hobby software. What about the guys who resell Altair Basic? Aren't they making money on hobby software? Yes, but those who have been reported to us may lose in the end. They are the ones who give hobbyists a bad name and should be kicked out of any club meeting they show up at. I would appreciate letters from anyone who wants to pay up or has a suggestion or comment. Signed, Bill Gates, General Partner, Microsoft. In the late 70s and early 1980s, Richard Stallman was doing artificial intelligence research and coding at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab. Richard had a number of negative experiences during that period which soured him on the whole idea of commercial software. Such as? Um, some code that he wanted to work on w and wanted to fix was locked up and he couldn't get the company that owned the code to let him fix it even though it would have been to their advantage to do so. And that put me into a moral dilemma you see because to get one of the modern computers of the day, which was the early 80s, you would have to get a proprietary operating system. The developers of those systems didn't share with other people. Instead, they tried to control the users, dominate the users, restrict them, saying, if to get this system, you have to sign a promise you won't share with anybody else. And to me, that was essentially a promise to be a bad person, to betray the rest of the world, cut myself off from society, from the cooperating community. And I had already experienced what happened when other people did that to us, when they refused to share with us because they had signed these contracts. And it hurt the whole lab, kept us from doing useful things before. So I just wasn't going to do that. I felt this is wrong. I am not going to live this way. And from experiences like this, he developed a profound hostility to the idea of intellectual property and software. He eventually acted this out by founding the Free Software Foundation. So I looked for another alternative, and I realized I was an operating system developer. If I were to develop another operating system, and then as the author, encourage everyone to share it, say, everyone, you come and get it, use this, form a new community, not only could I give myself a way to keep using computers without betraying other people, but I'd give it to everybody else too. Everybody would have a way out of that moral dilemma. And so I realized this was what I had to do with my life. I actually began the project in January of 1984. That's when I resigned from my job at MIT to start developing the GNU operating system. Now I should explain that the name GNU is a hack because it's a recursive acronym. It stands for GNU's not Unix. You see, so the G in GNU stands for GNU. And what the name means is, I was developing a system that was like the Unix operating system, but was not the Unix operating system. This was a different system. We would have to write it completely from scratch because Unix was proprietary. We were forbidden to share Unix. We couldn't use Unix. It was useless for a community. So we had to write a replacement for it. Well, Unix consisted of a large number of separate programs that communicated with each other. So we just had to replace these programs one by one. So what I started doing was writing a replacement for one program, and then another, and then another, and then people started joining me because I published an announcement inviting other people to join me to help write these programs. And, uh, and by Around 1991, we had replaced practically all of them. What were some of the programs that you Well, created? we had to, to have a complete system, you need to have a kernel, which is the program that allocates resources to all the other programs. You need a compiler, which translates a program from readable source code that 
programmers can understand into numbers, mysterious numbers that the computer can actually run. You need other programs that go with the compiler to help do this job. You need a debugger, you need a text editor, you need text formatter, you need mailers, you need lots and lots of things. There are hundreds of programs in a Unix-like operating system. The crucial thing about GNU is that it's free software. Now, free software refers not to price, but to freedom. So think of free speech, not free beer. The freedoms that I'm talking about are the freedoms to make changes if you want to, or hire somebody else to make changes for you if you're using the software for your business, to redistribute copies, to share with other people, and to make improvements and publish them so that other people can get the benefit of them too. Now those are the freedoms that distinguish free software from non-free software. These are the freedoms that enable people to form a community. If you don't have all these freedoms, you're being divided and dominated by somebody. Free software generally does have a copyright. It does have an owner. And it has a license. It is not public domain. If we put the software in the public domain, somebody else would be able to make a little bit of changes and turn that into a proprietary software package, which means that the users would be running our software, but they wouldn't have freedom to cooperate and share. To prevent that, we use a technique called copyleft. The idea of copyleft is that it's copyright flipped over. And what we do is we say, this software is copyrighted, and we, the authors, give you permission to redistribute copies. So we give you permission to change it, we give you permission to add to it, but when you redistribute it, it has to be under these terms, no more and no less. So that whoever gets it from you also gets the freedom to cooperate with other people if he wants to. And then in this way, everywhere the software goes, the freedom goes too, and it becomes an inalienable right to cooperate with other people and form a community. And so what is that, the license, what, what is that going? Well, copyleft being a general idea, in order to use it, you have to have a specific example. And the specific example we use for most GNU software packages is the GNU General Public License, a particular document in legalese which accomplishes this job. A lot of other people use that same license. For example, Linus Torvalds uses that license for Linux as well. Well, the license I use is the GNU General Public License. That's the one that Richard Stallman wrote, and I think it's a really astounding contribution. Uh, it's one of the few software licenses that was written from the standpoint of the community rather than from the standpoint of uh, protecting a company or, uh, as is the case with the MIT and the BSD license, uh, performing the goals of a government grant program. Uh, and the GPL is really unique in that it's not just a license, it's a whole philosophy that I think motivated the open source definition. I don't hide that a lot of what I do came from Stallman. The kernel happened to be one of the last things we started to do, and we had started it not long before. And that's when Linus Torvalds came along. Linus or Linus? What's exact your preferred pronunciation? Uh, when I speak Swedish, it's Linus. When I speak Finnish, it's Linus. When I speak English, it's Linus. And I really don't care how people pronounce my name. But Linux is always Linux. He developed a kernel and got it working faster than we got ours working and got it to work very nicely and solidly. His kernel is called Linux. The initial goal was my very personal goal to be able to run a similar environment on my computer that I had grown used to at, at the university computers. And I could not find anything that suited me for that. Right? So having been doing computers for all my life, basically, at that point I just decided that I'll do my own. Um, most of the inspiration early on came from, from Sun OS, which was what um, I was using at the university at the time. Which university? University of Helsinki in Finland. From 1991 to about 1993 was really, I guess, the infancy period of Linux. That was when it was still only alpha or beta quality. It was relatively 
unstable, although even then it was a good deal more stable than a lot of what are now called production operating systems. Linus used the traditional tried and true method of writing one program that does the job and he got it to work quickly, in fact faster than I would have thought was possible. The term for it is monolithic, which means that basically the OS itself is one entity, indivisible, um, while in a microkernel, a, the, the operating system kernel is actually uh, just a collection of servers that do different things and then they have a common protocol for doing communication between themselves. So why is it that if, if the GNU project had, had so much lead time to so speak doing this, why was why is it that he was able to kind of come in at the tail end, well, so to speak? Well, we actually started the GNU herd not long before he started Linux. And as it happened, though, we chose a design that's a very advanced design in terms of the power it gives you, but also turns out to be very hard to debug. It, we decided to divide up the kernel, which traditionally had been one program, to divide it up into a lot of smaller programs that would send messages to each other asynchronously to, to communicate. And the problem is that that style of programming has a great deal of potential for bugs, which are often very hard to figure out because they depend on does this, mess send, does this program send this message before or after this one sends that message? And the result was it took us years to get the thing to work. What is Linux's relationship to the GNU project? Well, there's there's relationships to, to GNU on kind of multiple levels. One is just a philosophical level of, of thinking that making your source open is a good idea. We know where Unix came from. We know where Linux came from. We know the how and why behind this, but we've got to still kind of fill in the gaps of what Linux really is. There are two major misconceptions over Linux. One major mi misconception is it's only command line text console with no graphics and really hard to use. And the other mis misconception is it's extremely graphical and it's no more use than a Windows 98 or a Windows 2000 computer. When the real conception of it is, is Linux can be whatever you need it to be. Now, if you look at the actual adoption curve of the internet, it follows Linux exactly. People were adopting Linux as fast as they were adopting the internet because people were getting the, all of these open source tools and building the things that they needed or not even needed. They just wanted. They wanted something to play with. You know, Debian is my personal use of Linux right now because of my skill level with Linux. And, you know, if you look at the Debian timeline here, just a, just a few of the Debian distributions, you know, starting off at 93, eventually went into Corel, which turned into Xandros. Lindos went into Linspire and then branched off to Freespire, while Linspire still existed. Nopix branched off to Damsmall. Damsmall branched off to Damsmall not. And, you know, uh, Nopix branched off to Morphix. There's just so many things in here that I couldn't even list. Like, uh, you know, Ubuntu has like 90 different distributions, and even Backtrack it was at one point based off of uh, Debian and Slackware. But Slackware is, uh, in my personal experience, a little bit more complicated to, to use. I don't have the, uh, the, the grasp of coding enough to use, to use uh, Slackware, but it's definitely a good one. Uh, you know, went from SUSE to SUSE to SunJDS to OpenSUSE, and then, you know, uh, then they got Slacks, which turned into Mini Slacks, Nimblex, Zenwalk, and then Gen2, and then Gen2 turned into Vita Linux, Bin2, and a thousand other more twos. And Red Hat, which is mainly used in enterprise stuff, you know, servers and business class kind of things. Uh, uh, nowadays, anyway, you know, it branched out to Caldera and Connectivia, which eventually, uh, and then Mandrake, which eventually all conspired into. Uh, one single Mandruvia release and Turbo Linux and Yellow Dog and uh, uh, oh, what, Fedora Core and just oh, Sent OS. There's just so many of them, it's really hard to cover them all. And you look at how the internet has grown and more and more people were adopting Linux because it had the tools that let you build the operating system to your need. If you needed something that was command line only, meaning it was only graphics, then that's what you build. If you wanted something that had a graphical interface, like say if you wanted something like Windows 95 or Windows 3.1, it's there. It's already there. If you wanted something really flashy with all these graphical embellishments and super huge high resolutions and 3D animations and fade effects, it's there. It's just a matter of what you want to do with it. The question is, can the hardware run the operating system? Now, that's really where Linux 
gives you the power. It allows you to take already existing tools, already existing hardware, and put them together to make something that you need. And in later segments, we're going to be getting into uh, doing some, some of these projects, turning ordinary uh, network-attached storage boxes into uh, wearable computers and turning uh, uh, routers into uh, Wi-Fi repeaters and uh, you know, penetration testers or turning handhelds into sniffers. And there's a million one things. You, know, you can even run Linux on, on your phone. You know, the, the game consoles are running Linux now. Look at the PlayStation 3. Look at the original Xbox. Well, you know, you can run Linux on that, even the Dreamcast. You know, it was never intended for these operating systems to run, and the reason it can is because it's open source. Companies like Apple and Microsoft basically wrap an operating system with a pretty little bow and say, fuck you, this is what you can do. Linux, do what you want.